you know, this lady, a nice Japanese lady, she let me come, she let me sleep on her floor in her, for four months I was there. We had lunch maybe about, I guess it was about a month ago, and uh, she reminded me because I had um, started the process to go into the police department. And she said, do you remember what you told me? And this was not when I was living with her, but after I had moved out, but you know, obviously mm -hmm. we stayed friends. She said, do you remember what you told me? And I said, no, and she says, I'll never forget that I asked you, I said, how long are you going to stay in the police department? Because she knew it wasn't anything I really wanted to do. And I said, eh, I think I'm going to stay until I make chief. And I said, <laughs> I really said that? And she said, I will never forget that. And when you made chief, it was just like, I was like, holy cow, that really happened. <laughs> 32 years later. Yep, 32 years later, exactly. When Susan Ballard joined the police force in 1985, there were few women cops, let alone in high positions. She didn't necessarily plan to make a career of being a police officer, but she persevered and overcame barriers. Honolulu Police Chief Susan Ballard, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one -on -one engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Susan Marshall Ballard grew up in the South, raised to be a proper Southern lady. She moved to Honolulu in the early 80s with no particular plans other than to look for work at McDonald's as a manager, a job she'd done before, until she figured out what to do next. Ballard became friends with police officers at the Central YMCA and they persuaded her to apply at the police department. Now there weren't many women cops at the time and there were many male officers who felt that women were not up for the job and could put them in harm's way. I guess I've always been a rebel, too. I mean, you know, even growing up, I was kind of a tomboy, you know, just because you sort of had to to take care of yourself because of the situation. But when I went into, uh, um, into recruit school, we had like about four women. We started out with like four women in our class, which was a large amount at the time. Um, and unfortunately, I think we only ended up, we ended, I'm sorry, we started with five and we graduated with three um, that continued on actually all the way through retirement. Two of them retired already, I'm the only one left, but you really did have to prove yourself. I mean, when you went to defensive tactics, it was like, you know, they would try their best to try and, um, you know, get you to, to quit, to, you know, to give up. Um, you know, the, the men, I always tell the story that, you know, there was a bunch of men in the class who, who formed the I Hate Women Club. You know, and so because they didn't think that women should be in mm -hmm. the police department, well, I didn't care. I would jump in the truck with them and say, well, sorry, I'm going with you regardless, you know. And I think after you kind of push yourself on them enough and they see that you can, um, you know, take care of yourself and you weren't going to back down, then, it, you know, things, things became easier. Is it right? Well, no, it wasn't, but, um, you know, that's, that's the way it was going through. But you didn't take school. offense? No, I, I really didn't. I, you know, I, it, it didn't really, um, it didn't really phase me. Um, and like maybe it, because I was just kind of oblivious or maybe I was in my own world somewhere, but I just, I just didn't pay that much attention to it. And I'll never forget when I first went out on the road, the first case that I went to, you know, the guy who was supposed to be covering me off and it was a domestic. So I went in and I said, are you coming in? He's standing outside the door like this and he says, no. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. No backup. So, yeah, yeah. So I went in and, you know, resolved the situation and stuff. And then after that, he was okay. But I had to, I had to prove that, you know, you could. And, you know, a couple of the other stories, uh, you know, that I tell is that we had a, when I was down in Waikiki, we had a, a hostage situation. So we had to call out SSD. At that time, it was a SWAT team. Um, and it was my beat. So it was like, oh, I was all excited because, you know, I was going to, you know, be there, you know, and you have this case. And so the SWAT team came and the SWAT major was there. And uh, so, um, and my lieutenant, uh, you know, bless his heart, Wally Akeo, he was like the best lieutenant ever. But, you know, he, he came and I says, okay, I said, you know, I'm going to go ask, you know, what is it that I can do? Because it's my beat. I want to make sure that I, you know, do what I can. So I went up to the, the major of, of the SWAT team and I said, excuse me, sir. I said, what is it that you want me to do? He said, be a good girl and go get us some coffee. Well, me being the person I am, I was ready to rip. I didn't care what his rank was. I was ready to rip into him. God bless my lieutenant. He grabs me by the, by the shirt and just pulls me out and he tells me, <laughs> Calm down, go over there, just calm down. But did you hear what he said to me? And he says, 
just take it easy. But you know, those are the types of things that you know that we had to deal with. Even if the main station, I don't back way back when our directive said that women had to wear brassieres, it was required. And so during our lineups, our lieutenants would come behind us like this, the women, and check like this to see if we had a, had a brassiere on. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that sounds like the Middle Ages. Exactly. Well, I mean, even the weight room. There was no weight. The weight room was behind the men's locker room. And so for us to go work out in the weight room, we had to walk through the men's locker room. And so we were only allowed to go down one side of the locker room. And as we approached the door, we had to yell, woman coming through, woman coming through. Well, I mean, let's face it. All that's going to do is egg them on. So you can imagine. I mean, we got flashed. We got, I mean, anything that you can imagine. And they always told us, you don't look. You keep your eyes straight ahead. It wasn't up. To, it didn't make any no. difference what they did. It was you look straight ahead. But yeah, so it was, it, was, um, it was an interesting time. And there was a time when an interview board asked you um, what rank you thought you would want to be, and you said captain. I did. And they said? They laughed. They said, oh, they'll never be a woman captain. I said, OK, well, good. OK, whatever. You needed to ask me something. I answered. I, I didn't even know what a captain was at the time, actually. So but you know, I figured, hey, that sounds high. I'll just <laughs> shoot for captain. <laughs> Along the way, I'm sure you made friends and, and got advice too. What, what, what kinds of advice did helped you along the way as a, at the time, rare woman and, and still rare woman in the police department? Um, you know, I go back that, you know, I was very lucky um, as, I, as I came through because I had a lot of really good supervisors. Um, and obviously, they were, most, they were all men because at the time there weren't that many women um, supervisors. Um, <clears throat> but Bill Clark, uh, was one of was my major at the training division when I uh, had become had become sergeant, and he was just um, you know I guess one of the things I always remember about him is that he would just tell us he says you guys do whatever it is that you need to do you go create programs do whatever you know take and, and that's kind of where I got from you know take risks and stuff you know try it if it doesn't work it's okay then I had. Uh, 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 um, Stephen Waterai, uh, Chief Waterai at the time, and everybody was just in fear of him. I mean, it was like when they told me I was going to go and work for him, I was like, oh, no. I said, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> but you know what? He sat, he sat me down. And he says, you know what? He says, I trust you until you show me that I can't trust you anymore. And you know what? And he said, he always everything he would support you he would you know go to bat for you um you know and and he was true to his word and as long as you didn't do anything that caused him not to trust you he was behind you 100 percent so i mean like i said i was very lucky and like wally akeo down when i was in waikiki when i first went down there um you know he was because there weren't that very few women but he always encouraged me to like, take the sergeant's test. He would encourage me to um, go out and do things that you know, I, I wouldn't normally do. Um, and you know, and said, it would basically tell me, you can do whatever it is that you want to do. And, you know, and that was back you know, in 88, you know, back when you know, it was unheard of. So I, I've always, like I said, I've always been, really been lucky for the most part, always working with some good supervisors who were very supportive. And, you, and then you dismissed the flack, pretty much. You just decided that was, you weren't going to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I gave this talk to my excluded managers. And one of the things that I, I said, you know, I, I learned a lot from my dogs. And one of them is, if you can't play with it, you can't eat it, pee on it, and walk away. <laughs> and sometimes, you know what, you, <laughs> if something doesn't serve you, if it's not working for you, you know what, you just got to walk away from it. You can't pay it any mind. It's like it's not worth you spending time to worry about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of been, you know, my philosophy all along. It's like, you know, because you can find yourself getting caught up in things and going, oh, well, this person's out to get me and this person. But you know what? Then you're letting them control your life. You mm -hmm. have to control your own life. You can't let people make you upset because they control you. You've got to control the way that you feel. And, you know, and it's a constant reminder. <laughs> I mean, even to this day, um, but, you know, I mean, that's one of the things, if you find yourself getting caught up in stuff, you know, it's like, okay, stop. You need to control your own destiny. Don't let other people control what you think or what you say. And don't spend one more moment on it, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. 
Former police chief Luis Kealoha was running the police department when Susan Ballard turned in her retirement papers. Morale in the department was low as the police force watched and waited for the chief to be indicted in a federal corruption case. A series of events during this time turned Susan Ballard in a new direction. You'd been through years and years of police being unhappy with chiefs. Kind of interesting. When I was a commander of District 4 um, out in uh, Kaneo and Kailua, um, I had said that, you know, when I hit, I think it was like 28, 28 years, I was going to retire. So it was about 27, I was at 27, and um, Chief Kealoha and uh, uh, Deputy Chief McCulley uh, were in power, and um, that's, they really started, um, and I, for whatever reason, I, you know, I, I don't know what it is. And, and obviously when you have power like that, you have people who are going to kowtow to you and do whatever it is that they want so that they can get ahead. And, you know, and I saw that. And so one person did that and um, they made allegations, you know, oh, well, you know, she's not being a team player or whatever. And it's like, without even asking me why I was doing what I was doing, it was like, okay, well, you're out of there. You know, you transfer, you're, you're going down the central receiving desk, which was, you know, like the place where you buried people. It was the bad place to work. You know, we only send people down there who are, you know, you know, not doing well and all this other stuff. So that's what happened. And instead of retiring, I said, you know what, I'm going to stay around and I'm going to be a, I'm just going to be a needle in their side. So it, I thank them for transferring me out of District 4 because if they hadn't, if they'd let me stay there one more year, I would have been gone. But they didn't. Once again, as I said, everything happens for a reason. So I went down to the desk and I was quite unhappy when I went to the desk. I was, it was like, you know, I'm not going to do anything. You know, it's like, you know what, the heck with these people. But then after about a week or two, you know, I started meeting the people who were working down there and said, you know what, these people don't deserve it. And so, you know what, I made up my mind at that point in time, it says we were going to make Central Receiving Deaths the best place to work in the department. We were going to take care of our little corner of the world. We didn't care what was happening on the outside. They can do whatever it is that they were doing, but we were going to take care of Central Receiving. And that's exactly what we did. And I got a team together. Um, the sergeants, the lieutenants, uh, you know, the officers who were down there, awesome group of people. I mean, it, all of a sudden it went from a place where half of them would transfer out every time that there was a transfer to people putting their names in to come and join us down at Central Receiving Desk. Um, and so at that point, so I decided, you know what, it was great. And I knew that they would never transfer me because they weren't going to put me anywhere. Um, so it was like, great, just leave me down here. I was having a great time, you know, had a great group of people to work with. And so lo and behold, you know, all this starts, you know, started happening. Well, we, we kind of knew what was going on, I think, long before, you know, the public. And, and so, you know, when it came out and then they finally, you know, he finally retired, um, because the indictment was taking so long, I thought, you know what, I mean, because it was like two years, three years or whatever that it took. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to retire. I said, you know what, I, I, I've got 32 years in the department. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, you know, apply for the position. But what had happened was that officers, not just the people who were working down the desk, but the officers would come in and they would ask me, are you putting in for chief? And I said, no, nah, I think I'm just going to retire. So it was actually the officers, they said, please, we're asking you, please put in to become chief. And I said, all right, and I did. And that's when, and so I, I put in, and, but I, I really, um, honestly, I never thought that this would happen because of, you know, what was going on, you know, with, with the chief that um, obviously the public, um, the commission, everybody thought, you know, we're going to go on the outside. We're going to pick somebody who's not in the department because everybody in the department is corrupt. And it helps you to be sidelined. It was. You're on the outs. Everything <laughs> happens for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was great. It, I mean, otherwise, you know what, I probably would have, you know, never been selected because, you know, I would have been um, tainted you know, with, with that administration. On October 25th, 2017, the Honolulu Police Commission announced its appointment of Major Susan Ballard to become Honolulu's 11th police chief and first woman at the top of the department.
when you're the police chief, you run in, on Oahu. I don't know if it's still true, but it was once the 11th largest city in America. It's a whole island. Um, that essentially you're running a mini city. Right. What's that like every day? When do you start? What do you do? Um, well, I usually, I mean, I do all my work out in the morning because I know that once my day starts, I lose control. Okay. So and are I, you a gym person or do you do it at home? I um, actually, uh, I, I've got my weight room at home um, and then uh, uh, I'll do, um, like I do, I, well, I'll do my yoga in, at a, you know, a couple of different yoga studios um, in town. Um, and then, you know, I, I'll jog on my treadmill like three days a week or whatever and then mm -hmm. um, kind of like do a boot camp type workout but it's all within my house. I really don't um, belong to a, a formal gym other than the than the yoga studios. So that way because I'm an early morning person I mean like really early. Early? How, what? How early? Like I wake up like midnight I, because I, I can't I have a hard time sleeping. When do you go to sleep? Usually that's why the nighttime events are so hard sometimes because I usually try and get to bed by about 7:30. Huh. And so um, yeah, my sleep I've I mean I had insomnia for quite a while. So now that if I can get four or five hours sleep, I'm like, yes. And, and then you wake up around midnight. Yeah, and so I usually do my workout um, and that uh, stretching and then you know getting you know getting ready and then go do my workout and stuff and um, that usually takes me till about maybe about two o'clock in the morning, two thirty, and then that's when I, I walk my dogs. <laughs> Wow. So, so everybody in Kailua knows. Here's the crazy chief. She's walking around. So, <laughs> so the, it's funny because the newspaper people deliver newspaper. They stop by and say good morning, you know. <laughs> and then after that, when I come home, um, then I usually have time to take like about an hour nap. And then I get up and then I go do yoga or whatever. Usually around five. You, five you've had a full day by the time you get I, to work. I do, and that's why I tell people. I said, you know, by the time you, you're you're five o'clock in the afternoon is my like midnight. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So um, yeah, and then uh, I usually get to work, and then you know try and you know clear up the email but like I said a lot of times I just have um, events um, and uh, you know those types of things and then I, we have what we call chiefs review so I, you know go out to the different districts and the divisions and you know talk to the officers and we do it a little different built different before it was very formal now I like you know the officers just to sit down and I want them to ask questions um, and they can ask questions about anything and I told him I said I'm if I can answer them, I'm going to answer them. If I can't, I'm going to find the answer and get back to you. And they know I'm not going to take offense to anything that you ask. Um, and I think the officers, you know, are realizing that. If I'm lucky enough to have a block of time free, I've been trying to actually, I go out um, and jump in a car with one of the officers and then, you know, go, go patrolling with them because, you know, you learn a lot from them, sitting in the car with them, you know, talking, I was down in Chinatown a couple of days ago, you know, and I was talking to some of the homeless when we were trying, getting to move off the sidewalk. Um, so it's, it's it, you know, I, I try and do that, um, you know, because, you know, at the same time, you know, the officers want to know that you're there for them as well. So, I mean, it's not just a community, like I said before, but, it, you know, it's, it's for the officers That's as well. That's true. You have a lot of constituents you know one things that people get upset about more than anything else is like parking and being stopped you know and they you know they'll oh you know you're just giving us a parking tag or you're just giving us a, a, a citation because you need the money yeah you, you should chase real crime right exactly mm -hmm. and you know and we tell them says okay well first let me clear up in this concession HPD doesn't get any of the money from the citations it all goes to the state nothing comes to us <laughs> But, you know, we tell them, says, well, you know, I mean, one of our biggest complaints, like I had a, one gentleman at one of the talks, and he was very outspoken that he felt that it was highway robbery that we were stopping people, um, you know, uh, for different types of traffic violations and that we should be out there solving the real crimes. And it's, you know, I told him, I says, well, I said, do you know what the number one complaint is from the communities, from almost every single community, um, besides the homeless, we'll just leave that out for now, but, um, is parking problems and speeding and other types of traffic, you know, uh, violations. Mm -hmm. I said, so we're out there doing what the community is asking us to do. And, you know, I mean, it's just like DUIs. You know, you stop someone who's drunk and they're, why are you stopping me? I didn't kill anybody. That guy's drunker than me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you feel like people are really watching closely? They do, um, you know, and I think more so uh, initially, like for example, um, you know, before, if I went out to dinner or, you know, what, you know or, or I'd meet my friends over at Whole Foods in Kailua and would have, you know, a couple of beers or whatever. I mean, I ride my bike everywhere. I don't ride my, drive my car. But now as chief, I, you know, choose that 
um, not to ever drink in public or have a drink because people don't know. They don't know that I'm not driving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they see me and they think, oh, well, here she is having a beer. I mean, look, you're talking about drinking and driving, mm -hmm. but you know, here's so. You know, I, I'm very careful about that, you know, that type of thing um, mm -hmm. so that, you know, if on the weekends, I'll, you know, after I come back from a hot yoga class, I like to have a beer. <laughs> so, you know, I'll have that at home. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, it, I mean, but that's something that I, you know, that, you know, I force on myself, not because, you know, anybody else had said, oh, well, you can't do this, or that has it, anybody ever made a comment. I guess I'm probably my worst mm -hmm. enemy. In the more, more recent past, Police chiefs haven't served all that long. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been a long tenure for them, mm -hmm. maybe seven years, five years. Mm -hmm. Before there were long serving police right. chiefs. What do you think you'll do? Um, I'm just, you know, I, I'm older than most. <laughs> so, I'm, you know, I, I, like I tell people, I said, you know, we, we're just taking it one year at a time. You know, I, I don't know in five years. I, you know, and a, a lot of it is be, the tenure shorter because there's just so many issues. It's not like before where mm -hmm. it was a more, I hate to say, simpler time, but it was. But now mm -hmm. there's, I mean, I would not want to be an officer out on the road now. There yeah. is so much stuff that they have to deal with and do that, you know, we didn't have to do coming up. You know, I was just thinking about men in the police department over the years. And, you know, there's, there, there is a certain amount of uh, stoicism and, you know, a, a face that doesn't show emotion and sunglasses and not talking too much. Yes. Did you ever feel like, hey, that's, that's kind of a model, strength, quiet strength model? It, it is, and it's still, and I think that, I mean, even you go to the chief level, because, I mean, you know, all the, you know, the chiefs have been pretty, you know, pretty stoic and, mm -hmm. and you know, the model that you're talking about. Um, and I think that might have been a big difference, a big change for people. You know, even the officers who are in the department, because now all of a sudden you've got somebody who is, for lack of a better term, I'm very loquacious. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, we laugh and we joke. I mean, before, if you went up on the fourth floor, which is where the assistant chiefs and our offices are, mm -hmm. you could hear a pin drop. I mean, it was dead silence. I mean, yeah. you, you know, it was like you went into this, uh, it was almost as quiet as a cemetery. Mm -hmm. Now you go up there and people laughing and joking. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a big change. And even the officers, it's like all of a sudden now they seem to have permission to smile. It's okay to smile. It's okay mm -hmm. to laugh. It's okay to be happy. You don't have to always put up that face. Unfortunately, we're still trying to, you know, like with the public, you don't have to be that, you know, that robot, that perfect person. And, you know, you can come out of your shell because, I mean, most of them are very personable people, you know, once you get to know them. But it seems like, you know, all these years that that is, you know, the uh, way that officers are portrayed. So we're trying to break that mold, mm -hmm. um, you know, and trying trying to move out of that uh, that realm. Well, you heard what the mayor's representative, I think the mayor was out of town, but it was Roy Amamiya mm -hmm. saying, you know, that you've been chosen and your job is to restore trust in the police. And it is true that uh, there have been a number of scandals and, uh, and, and uh, incidents such as uh, domestic violence and, the, and an unwillingness to address that. Mm -hmm. um, and and how, do you, how do you plan to restore that trust? You know, it's kind of interesting that uh, when I first uh, became chief, it was during Christmas season, parade season. Um, and so I was, you know, walking in the in some of the parades, and uh, you know, um, you know, people would, you know, yelling and cheering and stuff. And I was just walking down. I was like, wow, they are really excited about their parades. And one of my deputy chiefs turned to me and said, Chief, you know that they're cheering, they're yelling because you're going by, and I'm going what? And so I started going over and shaking people's hands and stuff, and you know, and, and basically saying thank you. And it was just so humbling that. Everything that this department has gone through, you know, in the last several years, that the community, and this was everywhere, was willing to forgive and forget. I mean, maybe not totally forget because it's always going to be back there. It wasn't just the community's trust that was broken. Our department in internally, the officer's trust was completely obliterated. I mean, to the point where you had retirees that were embarrassed to say that they retired from the Honolulu Police Department and that they would not say anything. 
But you know what? It's nice to hear now that uh, you know that they're proud of saying that they are you know retired from the Honolulu Police Department because they see that we are trying to change. And just like I tell people when we go outside, I said it's not going to happen overnight. And I'm not going to tell you that our officers aren't going to do anything wrong because they absolutely will. It's no different from your children. They're going to make bad decisions and they're going to make bad choices. But we are going to, you know, we're, we're going to address it. I can tell people even now, the, the people who get promoted, I said, you know, the higher you go, the more humble you need to be. Why do you need to flaunt your power? I mean, yeah, you've got it. It's there. But why? I mean, if you have to do that, then obviously you're, you're doing something wrong. I said, you know, you should be, like I said, the, the most humble person in the world the higher up that you go because, you know, the way people feel comfortable around you, um, and you can get a lot more things done. At the time of our conversation, Honolulu Police Chief Susan Ballard was eight months into her five-year term as police chief and one month shy of her 33rd year in the department. Mahalo to Honolulu Police Chief Susan Ballard of Kailua, Oahu, for sharing your stories with us, and mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha nui. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. You know, I always tell people, I said, you know, as long as you do the right thing for the right reason in the right way, then I, I, I feel fine. I mean, there's always going to be people, you're never going to get everybody to agree. There's always going to be somebody who disagrees with you, and that's just the world that we live in. But as long as you don't do anything you know, mean or retaliatory, um, and but you do it for the betterment of the community, the betterment for the officers, then how can you go wrong? Um, you know, and, and, and if I'm wrong, I'll be the first to admit, okay, well, we messed up, or if a law is passed and says, oh, well, you can't do this anymore, okay, well, you know, you've given me my direction, you know, and we'll have to move in that direction. But as long as, you know, as long as you do it with a good heart, and you're doing it for the right reason, you know, I, I, I can go home and I can sleep at night. <laughs>